on the garments that suit God's beloved people. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Let us worship God. We sing together in hymn number 18, The Earth Belongs to God Alone. God 
faithfulness, you are Lord of all being, and all of our life is your gift to us. From the first light of morning till darkness falls, <coughs> you are there. From the baby's first cry to the child's first step, from the adolescent's rebellion to the wisdom of age, you are involved in the mix and the mess of our lives. From the poet's skill with words to the painter's eye for colour, from the scientist's inventions to the engineer's construction, you are always doing new creative things. You alone are God, worthy of all praise. Yet how often in our inwardness do we forget to give you thanks? How often in our conceit do we think we have done it all ourselves? How often in our wrong-headedness do we think we can go it alone? How often in our perversity do we tell ourselves wrong is right? How often in our waywardness do we choose what's bad for us and other people? How often in our blindness do we fix our eyes not on the unseen things which are eternal, but on the things that are seen which are passing away? Too often is the answer, yet you never give up on us, never keep score of wrongs, never cast things up to us. So we trust ourselves again to your care, compassion and kindness, believing that even now your love will draw us into goodness through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose words we say together, Our Father, who art, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy <coughs> kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In 436, is Christ triumphant, ever reigning Saviour, Master King. <coughs> Oh, 
This morning our Bible readings are both taken from the New Testament. And first of all, the reading from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Reading in chapter 1, from verse 15 through to verse 23. For this reason, Paul writes, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills, fulfills everything in every way. And then we read from the book of Acts, reading from chapter 1, from verse 1 through to the end of 11. And this celebrates Jesus being taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After this he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. And thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer.
yes, that's perfect. The Testament of Gideon Mack is a novel by the Scottish writer James Robertson. And if you like reading novels and you haven't read it, let me commend it warmly to you. The Gideon of the title is a minister in the Church of Scotland in the fictional parish of Monacascan, a small town on the east coast of Scotland. He was born in 1958. He was brought up as a son of the manse, but his domineering, bullying father did not endear him to the church. The story is very interesting in many ways, one of them is that it talks about the many changes in Scottish society that you and I have lived through. Not least how people have become distanced from the church and why that is the case. But the main interest is in the character of Gideon himself. The last thing Gideon ever thought he would do was to follow his father into the ministry. Not least because he doesn't believe in God. But his wife said to him one day, do you have to believe in God to be a minister? And he said, yeah, it's, a, it's an essential qualification, I think. <laughs> and she said, even in this day of age, surely, she said, being a minister is a kind of social worker with an added qualification in rhetoric. <laughs> you could do that. And so Gideon went into the ministry. I don't think I've ever known a minister who came into the church not believing. And I don't think I've known a minister who stayed in the church once he lost faith. I don't think we're expected to believe that is possible. What I do know is that many ministers, and I would include myself among them, don't think that we should take the Bible literally. Taking the Bible seriously does not mean taking it literally. The Bible is a record of the people of faith's experience of how God is involved in the world. And it uses all sorts of different ways to communicate that. Sometimes it's prose, sometimes it's poetry, sometimes it's irony, sometimes satire, sometimes humour, sometimes ethical teaching or moral codes, a whole variety of ways. In our business, the business of the church in every generation, is to interpret the scriptures in the light of Christ under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we try to do. I'm saying that this Sunday, which is known as Ascension Sunday, because I wonder what you made of the story from the book of Acts that we read a moment or two ago. Jesus, after telling his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until the power of the Spirit came upon them, then vanishes up into the sky. And we're told the disciples were standing there watching him as he went. Are we meant to take that literally? <coughs> that Jesus whooshed up through the atmosphere until eventually he reached heaven, which we know is not a place, but a way of describing where God is. And if we don't take it literally, what are we to do with it? I think we can explain it quite simply by saying that the view of the world in the first century was totally different from how we view it today because they simply did not have the knowledge that we have today. Contemporary belief in the first Christian century was that the earth was here 
there was the sky and heaven above this dome, and there was the place of death or Hades under the earth. It was a three-decker universe. And that's how they thought about it. And so when they came to talk about the ascension of Jesus, they did it in the way it's done in the book of Acts. But what are we to make of it? I think we can make of it in the first instance, it's a way of saying that the Jesus who came from God went back <coughs> to God. Whenever you hear about a cloud in the Bible, a cloud is the way of talking about the presence of God. Jesus disappears into the cloud. He goes to be with God. And what that means for us is that if we think about God, we have to think about him in terms of Jesus. We cannot think of Jesus apart from thinking of him in terms of God. And that is absolutely essential to our belief. And sometimes, historically, the church has got that wrong. It has forgotten that the God we believe in is, as they say in the scriptures, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To understand God, we understand him through Jesus. And we understand Jesus in terms of relationship to God. That's the first thing I think this story means for us. The second thing I think the story means is that the spirit that enlivened Jesus and which was limited while he was on earth to the people he met and the people who followed him is now free as it were to be with all people at any time in any place. Brian Wren in one of his hymns puts it brilliantly. He said, Christ is alive. No longer bound to distant years in Palestine, he comes to claim the here and now and dwell in every place and time. That's what the ascension means. It's right that we think about the Jesus of history, the Jesus who walked in Galilee and who did and said what he did and said. But it's equally important to think of Jesus as a living presence. He is not just a figure from the past. He is a figure in our lives now who influences us and who shapes us by the power of the Spirit which has been given to us. So we celebrate his living presence every bit as much as we celebrate the Jesus of history. And that is a vitally important thing, I think, for us to remember. And the third thing I think the ascension is about is about power. Every time in the New Testament it says of Jesus is ascended, it says Jesus is going to sit at the right hand of God, which is what we read from the letter to the Ephesians. And the right hand of God is the position of power. Obviously God does not have a right and a left hand, but it's a way of speaking about power. We live surrounded by power of all different kinds. There's political power, there's economic power, there's military power. There's all these different kinds of power that we are familiar with day to day. And we wish often were very different. Jesus has none of the conventional instruments of power. He has no money. He has no property. He has no connection with people in the right places. He is crucified as a powerless enemy of the state. claim of faith is that this Jesus who 
died this way as he had lived <coughs> is the expression of the power of God. Again, Brian Wren puts it brilliantly. Not thrown afar, remotely high, untouched, unmoved by human pains, but daily in the midst of life, our Saviour in the Godhead The cross seemed to have been the defeat of Jesus and of God's purposes in Jesus. And yet, the resurrection affirms that he is the expression of the love of God. He is the yes, as Paul puts it, to all God's promises. Because he does not pay back evil with evil. He does not seek revenge. He does not retaliate. He commits himself and he stays committed to non-violence. And this is the power which will ultimately prevail. Martin Luther King used to say about teaching his followers non-violence, it's vitally important because the power of the state and the power of police, they know how to deal with violence. And they are much more powerful and violent than we could ever be. But they don't know how to deal with non-violence. And he was right. And you'll remember the picture of Tiananmen Square when the tanks were rolling in and this solitary man went up and he stood there confronting the tanks. If you think to yourself, that is it. Where does the power lie? It doesn't lie ultimately with the people who are the tanks and the guns. The power of God is invested in this Jesus who is non violent and who does not retaliate and who does not seek revenge and who calls the blessings, not curses. ascension that we celebrate today is an important doctrine for these three reasons. It says that we must not think about God apart from Jesus. It says that the spirit that enlivened Jesus and was given to his disciples is now given to anyone who will respond to says ultimately the power that Jesus exercised through non-violence and all the other things is the power that ultimately will prevail in our world. And it is that, above all, that gives us hope for the future. Amen and may God bless to us this preaching in his name and to his name be the glory In 702, Lord in love and perfect wisdom.
generous, giving God. It is your intent that of all the people who have ever lived, one man should express who you truly are. And one name should go on inspiring us from generation to generation. Jesus from Nazareth is the man, and the name above all names. And we thank you that he has called us to continue his ministry to the world. Our prayer is that your spirit will move us to see him, know him and trust him in the everyday experience of our lives and will help us to pass on his name to all who wish to receive it. Today we hold up to you for blessing those with big names and positions of power that they do not use it to bully or intimidate or to promote or benefit themselves but use it to serve to lift up those cast down to encourage the faint-hearted to protect the weak and the vulnerable and to advance the common weal We ask your blessing in all required to make big decisions that directly affect the lives of others in health, education, law enforcement, in business, employment, transport, in energy and climate change, that they can balance competing interests and come to wise decisions that bring the greatest good to the greatest number. And among the many troubled places of our world, we remember those suffering in the gun culture of the United States. We remember the people of Ukraine. And we pray for the people of Israel, Palestine. Bring an end to house demolition, to children being put in prison, to pass laws and harassment, to cruelty and violence and lies presented as truth so that peace with justice may yet prevail. Lord, hear our prayers and let our cry come to you in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In 449, rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King at all. Thank you. 
And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the company of the Holy Spirit be with you and stay with you this day and forevermore. Amen.